Peace be with you, brothers and sisters, following this program, Come to Me. Come to Me is an invitation that our Lord Jesus Christ gives and each and every one of us. He wants all of us to come to, he, to Him, no matter who we are, no matter what we have done in our past, no matter the mess we're doing now, no matter the good we're doing now, all of us are in need of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And today I would like to introduce you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, to a very particular person who has come a long way from the States to Malta, here to give his testimony about his life and about what Jesus is doing in his life. He's got a very particular testimony. I mean, just imagine, before we just say anything, if your wife had to be raped, what would you do about it? Just don't answer at the moment, but have your gut feeling about it. You will hear more Jeff's story, who is here with us, to share with us his amazing story. It is not just his story, it is God's story in his life, and the particular kid's story, and his wife's story. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. So, Jeff, can you just tell us something about you in general? I mean, how old are you? Where do you originally come from? You know, so people would be curious before listening to your story, to some sure. basics info about you. Okay. Um, I'm 43 years old. I'm from the States. I've lived in a couple of different places in the world. Uh, we're currently on the East Coast of the United States. We've been married 23 years. We have four children. Sorry, five children. The uh, oldest is 21 and out of the house, and the youngest is three. Four. Four years old. Yeah. He just turned four back in September. And what do you do for a living? I, am a work, I work for an automotive supply company. Um, our customers are car dealerships, car uh, manufacturers, and I do uh, packaging for the company I work for. Okay. And how was your upbringing in life? Um, I was raised uh, in a Christian home. Uh, we traveled a lot. My dad was in the military. So we've lived in a couple of different countries around the world. And everywhere we've lived, uh, we have found a home church there that we've attended. And um, my brother and I, I have one brother, uh, we grew up in that environment um, and ended up graduating from high school in San Diego on the West Coast. And you said you married. What's the name of your wife, Jeff? My wife is Jennifer Christie. So tell us a little bit how you met Jennifer. Well, we actually met at a church youth group. Um, we went to different schools at the time. And we were both very active in the church. And we uh, attended a lot of these activities together and got to know each other really well going through high school. Uh, we didn't actually start dating until we were adults. And we got married when I was 20 and she was 19, and that was 23 years ago. 23 years ago. Yes. We know that in your marriage, something very, mm -hmm. would say, terrible happened, that is, your wife was raped. Sure. Can you just first tell us a little bit what happened exactly? We'll go through all the details, your reactions, her reactions, but, I mean, how did you get to know that? What happened? What was the circumstances? How did it happen? Okay. Um, it was almost five years ago. She's a sign language interpreter. She does a lot of work uh, in the area around the house, but three, four, or five hours away. So every now and then we'll have her stay in the town that she's working for a couple of days. And she was at the end of one job uh, in such a town a few hours away. And on the last night there uh, in her hotel room, she was attacked. Um, it was snowy. It was weather that that town is not used to, that we're not used to. And the town was essentially shut down. There was nobody around. And uh, when she got back to her hotel to sleep before coming home, there was a man there at her door uh, before she was able to get in. And he uh, hit her, stunned her, and assaulted her. Um, he essentially left her for dead. We found afterwards that uh, she was not his only victim. Um, she was his only victim who has lived. Um, and. Uh, the assault was hard to take. It was hard on us as a couple. Uh, we told our children that she had been in an accident to explain the bruises. We didn't know if they were ready yet to understand the full extent of what she had been through. Uh, we didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, it was a new experience for both of us, obviously. She um, was changed. Her life was different from that point. Uh, she didn't know what she would do or who she would be day to day, and me, as her husband, it was hard for me to see. It was hard for me to understand what she was going through um, and to know what I was supposed to do to help. Obviously, I didn't want her to be going through this. 
I didn't know how to make it better for her. So did the rape result in a pregnancy? It did. Uh, we found so out weeks how, later. Well, how long did it take for you to find out? I mean, from the moment of the situation, you were still under a shock. The fact that it happened, then mm. then there was a pregnancy. Correct. How that has augmented the situation for you? Well, there was about six weeks later. Um, we were still feeling our way in this new world of her post-traumatic. Um, she was different. The way she reacted to the world was different. We weren't sure what, what to do day to day. And uh, she was away at the time, and she contacted me and said, well, I'm pregnant. Um, I, wouldn't, I'm, I wasn't shocked. I was, I was surprised. Um, but what I felt at that moment and what I could see that she was feeling, even though she may not have known it, um, this was a different situation. This was hope and light. Um, she was a woman who was assaulted, who was attacked and raped and victimized and could not trust the world she was in anymore. Um, but this pregnancy became something that we could control. This child was something that we could have but a hand in. what were the first things that crossed your mind? I'm just, the very first thing that <clears throat> came to your mind, I mean, if your wife was raped, now there is a pregnancy, it's not your child. It's not her child in the sense that she wanted this. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing, you, from the husband, the man, what crossed your mind? The first thing I thought was, we're having a baby. Um, honestly, uh, it was just, she's pregnant. We've been married almost 19 years at the time. And we had had four children previously. So we were not strangers to her being pregnant. The circumstances of the pregnancy were obviously different. But... In my mind, um, the first thing I thought was, we're having, we are having another child. And uh, what were the first thoughts that Jennifer went through? She was a little panicked. Um, she didn't know how to handle herself before this. Um, she, in her testimony, she talks about how for the first time in her life, when she saw the ultrasound, um, she hoped. For the first time in her post-traumatic life. Uh, she said it was the first time she smiled after she had been attacked. Uh, because in both of our eyes, in both of our minds, a child is an amazing gift. So was an abortion an option in this situation? It was never something we thought about. Um, being raised Christian, I've always been pro-life. Uh, we're both very strong in the church and we're both pro-life. To us, abortion was never a question in our circumstances. What happened was... Uh, my wife is pregnant, therefore we're having a child. But don't you think that keeping a child in such a situation would just lock, especially the woman, in the trauma of mm -hmm. the rape she went through? I mean, every time she would look at this child, she would remember the fact that she was raped, all the violence she went through, this unwillingness. I mean, mm -hmm. would you call that loving your wife wanting her to keep the child and keeping her logged in a traumatic situation? So keeping the child, I think, is loving my wife. I can tell you um, from stories I heard before this um, that rape is a horrible assault on a woman. It breaks down her trust of society, of men in general. Um, it's something that she's not re going to recover from. And I have heard society and the world saying, how could you imagine that, what a horrible idea if someone got pregnant from rape? I can tell you from that six week period, I have seen what rape does to a woman. That she, when a woman has been traumatized in such a horrible fashion, she's different. Her outlook on life is different. And having a child or not having a child is not gonna change the fact that she has been already traumatized and attacked. Um, it is not something she would have forgotten are fully recovered from, um, regardless of whether she got pregnant or not. I, we see this as two separate um, chapters in our life. She was assaulted. We had to learn how to live after that. She had to learn how to be a woman in the world after she was raped. Um, her getting pregnant means that we're having a child. The circumstances of that pregnancy did not have any bearing on the boy that we had from this pregnancy, it didn't have any bearing on the fact that our family just became bigger. 
And what has helped you to look at it in this way? Because we know from real life situations that mm -hmm. not everybody would do the choices that you made, which I would care heroic choices now in favor mm -hmm. of life. Uh, but what has helped you to do them, to sustain them, both on a spiritual level, on a physical level, on an emotional level, on mm -hmm. a mental level, because it's not something that is to do like that, you know? So w where did you find the strength to do it? Who has helped you to do it? I mean, was it something automatic that happened in you? I mean, just tell us about it, because I sure. think many people who would go through such traumatic situations, whether they have support or not, whether they have internal resources or not, all bears on the situation mm -hmm. and on the final decision, whether am I going to keep the baby or not? So it's not just simply the, the question, am I going to keep the baby or not? It's what can sustain me in keeping the child. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, being raised in the church and being a strong believer in God, my faith definitely had a factor in this. Uh, we, we learned from the Bible that um, life begins at conception, that God has a plan for us before we re even exist. So coming from that standpoint, from that beginning, um, we know that, that every life is precious and that God has a hand in creating that life. It, the most important part of that life is him. So we have relied, we had a heavy, a very good church family at the time, lots of support there. Um, but even within the church, you're going to find people who, I would say who would falter at that um, situation. Uh, even the strongest Christians and the strongest believers in God tend to feel like, I, I want to understand what other people are going through or what they would feel in that situation. And I can tell you from experience that in that situation, we did have the strength that God gave us, um, the foundation from the Bible. And a strong family, God-fearing family that helped us through this. Um, there were naysayers, of course. There were people, friends, family, who thought the concept of having this child was so foreign and horrible. And the biggest factor in that, I think, is the fact that they weren't there. And that's something that I've learned that I need to be able to share with people, is that we all want to look at the woman's point of view. What if she's been raped? What if she's had this horrible experience? How could you imagine having a child in that situation? And the answer that I would give, I would say, if you want to know what the woman in that situation is thinking, you ask her. You talk to women who have been through this. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but something like 75% of women who become pregnant from rape keep the child. And um, I have not talked to anybody in my experience of talking to these women and meeting with a lot of people in similar situations that we've met with over the years. I have not seen one person regret their choice to have that child. Now, specifically as the husband mm -hmm. of Jennifer, I mean, how did you live the situation? Because at the end of the day, you were not carrying the child yourself. You were not the one who was, who was traumatized, but she was. I mean, so it's a very different situation. And perhaps it's very good to have you here now because, you know, <laughs> Thank you. you know, in many times, uh, even in such situations, some women are pressured for an abortion, sure. not simply out of their own choice, but out of the pressure that other family members or friends would do. So mm -hmm. you didn't do that pressure on Jennifer. So somehow you were a great help. You were part of the oh. healing process itself in Jennifer. But how would you have lived it as the husband, as the man? <sighs> I'm not sure what to say to that. Um, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm humbled by that. But I can tell you that my point of view in this and my uh, opinion for her and my love for her was grounded in my faith in God and my belief that uh, all life is precious. So for me to, I can't conceive of the idea of pressuring her to get rid of this child. Um, they, and we say this a lot, that these seem to be, these are two separate chapters in our life. She was attacked, she was raped, and we had to learn how to live with that, um, how to get through it. She, she got pregnant from the rape. Um, those rapists caused her to get pregnant. Um, but the conception is one second in time. Uh, the pregnancy itself is something she'd been through. She, we know she has babies. She's good at it. She's had a few. Um, 
uh, the pregnancy wasn't, didn't seem like a trauma to us. It, it wasn't traumatic to think of the idea of carrying this baby for nine months because that's nine months of the baby's life and nine months of your life. And then that's an entirely new life in the world that has a potential that somebody has to do whatever they want to. And that's something that we could not stomach taking from somebody. That is not our place to make the decision for this life to not start. Once this life is there, once this baby is growing inside of her, we're not going to make the conscious decision to end that opportunity. That's God's call. Amen. Now I'd like to ask you another question, which is a little bit, a bit more sneaky. But you know, okay. I try to ask questions that people would ask. Sure. But so, okay, so we, we've seen your side. Mm -hmm. We've seen Jennifer's angle. But this child now, mm -hmm. when he's going to grow, when he starts to reason, I mean, you allowed him to live. Well, you yeah. carry it through him. But what's going to happen to him emotionally on various levels when he comes to know, he doesn't know who his father is, that he's not the fruit of, of love, mm -hmm. that he is the fruit of uh, rape. What if he tells you, I prefer if you had aborted me. I will not carry this pain and this wound the rest of my life. I mm. mean, uh, he might tell you that in the future. How are you ready for that? I are think you ready to shoulder that responsibility? What will you tell him? Well, he's four now, so we have some time. We have some time to work on it. But part of that is going to be how we raise him. It's going to be what he understands moving forward. This assault was um, very well, it was on the news. There's a police report. Uh, he is not going to not know what happened to him or how he was conceived. Um, but what he is going to know is that he has two parents who love him dearly. He has four siblings who don't look at him any differently than, than they do each other. Um, I mean, it's the same argument that you would make for kids who are adopted, who have to deal with the trauma of the fact that their birth parents may not necessarily have wanted them or been able to keep them. They don't know what happened in that story. In his case, he will know that he was conceived in a situation that was horrible for his mom, but he was raised in a home with parents that love him and treat him no differently than they do his other siblings. So for you, love is the answer. Love is the answer. And he will be able to take it when he is an adult because he will have that foundation of knowing I am their child. There's no question about that. So now tell, us, tell us a little bit about him, about him. what's his name, how old is he, how he does with the rest of the children, how he has mm -hmm. influenced, changed, modified your family. So now, now it's what he has brought to the family. Sure. He, uh, he's eight years old, younger than his nearest sibling. We thought we were finished with kids. We had changed diapers for 10 years straight before he came along. We got rid of all of our baby equipment, all of our cribs and diapers and diaper bags. It used to take us 10 minutes to get out of the house. We just told the kids, we're leaving. They would get in the car and go. So it was definitely a little bit of a shock, him being back in, you know, us being back in that world with babies. Um, but it's not something we weren't used to. We just had to remember it, just like getting back on a bike. Um, his siblings... They didn't know the nature of his conception initially. They just knew mom and dad are having another kid. Great, one more thing for us to deal with. They fight, they play together. He gets into other people's things. Um, he writes on the walls just like the other kids did, or he did. He's four years old now. He's gotten over the writing on the walls. Um, but uh, he's, his upbringing is no different from the other kids. His impressions of life are no different from his siblings. When we first told them what had happened and how he was conceived and what had happened with his mom, they were concerned about her. They were worried about the pain that she had been through. But their, their image of their brother didn't change. Um, he has been their brother since, he was, um, since my wife was pregnant. And that, and that carries on throughout their, ch their childhood. His oldest brother uh, is 18. And he's somewhat adopted him, takes care of him a lot. These two are best friends. He's threatened to take uh, him with him when he goes off to college, which he won't, of course. He's our kid. But um, all of the kids get along just like any other siblings do. Any family, family with a lot of kids, they fight sometimes, they play sometimes. Um, there's, no there's no outside indicator among these kids that he's different. And I would challenge anyone to catch to look at our family dynamic and say that one's different. 
uh, his brothers would stand up for him. They will take up arms if they need to, just like they would for each other. And how does your wife, Jennifer, look at him now? Oh, the same as all the other kids. This kid, he's amazing. He's funny, he's happy, he's so loving. He's been, <sighs> it sounds cliche, but he's been a godsend. Um, we had to figure out how we were going to move forward from this. And this is how. You, you have a child, you go through all the pain and the joy of raising a child, getting out of diapers, um, teaching them how they should grow up. And it's, it's been a fun experience for us. He's super funny, he's super affectionate. Uh, he loves getting in front of the camera. He loves uh, giving kisses. Um, you wouldn't know anything's different about his conception by looking at him. One final thing, Jeff. Yes, sir. Just to ask you, you know. Sure. <laughs> but weren't you ever angry at God because of this situation? It's a tough question and it's a tough answer because there were times when I was, I was, I was spitting mad. I would spend time. JJ says that um, I was always smiling and strong and supportive for her, but she would hear me in the shower. And when I'm alone, that's when I let my frustrations out. I would cry out to God in anger um, at what we were going through. I had some pretty violent thoughts in my head that I couldn't control uh, geared towards this guy that had done this to my wife. Um, anytime anybody hurts someone you love, especially your wife, you have that tendency to want to defend her and, and make up what happened to her. And I felt that. And my thoughts towards this guy were not very godlike. I'll admit that. Um, but my faith never wavered. My concept that God has a plan for us never wavered because we'd been through a lot in our 19 years of marriage at the time. And we've seen people and talked to people who have been through a lot. And through it all, I've always seen that God had a plan in it. We may not know it, and we may not see it for a long time, but my faith that God was involved didn't waver. And from the moment that we found out she was pregnant, uh, we knew that God had a hand in that because we, we felt the healing that came from raising a child, that we knew God knew what we needed at the time. Did you ever get in touch with the rapist? No, and actually as it happens, um, shortly after, well, not shortly, a few years later, we found out that he had been killed by a family member of another one of his victims. Um, so that chapter is kind of over in our lives. We don't have to worry about him being part of the kid's life, which in a lot of states in the United States, that is a problem, where people, convicted rapists, will have, you know, a time with their kids and share custody. And that seems ridiculous seems unnatural but it's an it's a big threat to us and we didn't we had talked about it and we didn't know what we would do if this came about um have you forgiven I, the rapist i have i would i would have to say i'll have to admit to you that it was posthumous forgiveness um whenever we talked about what would happen if we saw him or if we had to deal with him I did not know how I would react. I, didn't, I was not ready to talk to him or to face him um, without violence. Um, I'll admit that I, had, I was not ready to face him and see him as another human being. Um, I think that as bad as it is anytime anybody is killed, this turned out to be kind of a backwards blessing for us, that we don't have to have that scenario in our life. Thanks a lot, Jeff. I would mm -hmm. like to congratulate you to encourage you for being very human and yeah, yet based on faith. You know, because such experiences, undoubtedly, I can never understand you. Oh. I've never went through such a situation, you know. I can never understand you from within. Well, we sure. can do so conceptually, but not a real life situation mm -hmm. like that, no. So, but I would assume, yes, there would be this anger, difficulty to forgive, yes. anger towards God, etc. But the final word, and this is the beauty, mm -hmm. is not the anger, is not that, is not retaliation, is not vindication, but the final word is being, because it's a continual process, yes. it's God himself, who is love and mercy. So thanks a lot for being a living icon. I promise you to pray for you, so well, that you. the story will continue to grow, 
God will continue to sustain you. You will find the right help throughout your life. And in a very simple way, you continue to be a blessing also for others. So final thing before I give my final message, would you just give a direct message to the audience? Perhaps somebody who might be watching you somewhere in the world who is going or might go through the situation you went through. You mentioned the fact that uh, you don't understand what what, what it is. And most of the world doesn't understand and that's something that I wrestled with as a Christian, as a pro-life man in the world. You have the arguments, you have the science and the faith that tells you that all life is precious, but you don't know how to answer people who have been through it. And what I would say is these women who have been assaulted, who ha- are pregnant from it, they have their own story to tell. Instead of sta- instead of Uh, speaking up for them, I would ask you to talk to them and ask them what it's like. And you'll find that the answer may not be what you expect it to be. And for most women who have been through this, who are in this situation, it's not what society tells you it's going to be. So, once again, thanks a lot, Jeff. Mm -hmm, I would like to thank you all the audience who have following this program, dear brothers and sisters. Today we have had a, a life story It's not something we read from the Word of God, but is a living testimony of what it means to have Jesus in your life, giving you the power of faith, the power to forgive, the power to be healed, even when we go through most difficult situations. You know, the story of Jeff and Jennifer, they were churchgoers. You know, sometimes bad things happen also to good people. Life is like that. But we have seen in their own testimony the difference that God can do in our lives. And this is the beauty which will I'd like that all of us will be attracted to it. Now, sometimes it's just much more easier to condemn somebody who might be thinking of an abortion, who wants to do an abortion because of, of a rape situation. Whereas here we have stories that even though they acknowledge the pain, the difficulty and the suffering one can through, they bear witness to the testimony of what the power of faith, of what the living Jesus can do in our lives. So my prayer for each and every one of you, dear brothers and sisters, especially for those who might might have gone or are going or will go through such a situation, yes, do seek help, do seek support, don't live it on your own. It's normal to go through negative thoughts, negative reactions, but let them not be the last word. Love, which is God himself, if you open your heart to him, will be the last word in your life. May God bless you all. I keep you my prayers. Send our regards to Jennifer and all the kids. Thank you very much. Let's keep our appointment for the next program. God bless you. Take care.